Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Tonight we are going to be looking at a letter in the Bible that's oftentimes referred to as the Apostle Paul's magnum opus, his, his great work. And down through uh, church history, there have been many people who through reading the book of Romans have been converted to Christ. One such person was Augustine, who is oftentimes referred to in the church as Saint Augustine. Aurelius Augustine was one day when he was in his BC life, before he was a Christian, he was a very wild man. He lived, he lived La Vida Loca. <laughs> he even fathered a child out of wedlock. And one day he happened to hear some kids playing outside and they were saying, tole lege, tole lege. Take up and read. Mm. Augustine, he had a Bible that he let fall open to the book of Romans. And fell open to Romans chapter 13, I believe, and he began reading a particular verse in Romans chapter 13, and he was converted to the gospel, or converted to Christ converted by the gospel to Christ. Then there was John Wesley. John Wesley had already been serving in ministry. It wasn't until he heard the gospel being expounded upon from Romans that he became converted. Then there is Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk and serving within the confines of the Roman Catholic Church as a monk, that he began to understand the great truth of justification by faith alone as he read the book of Romans. It was he who began to say that the church stands or falls on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so the book of Romans is a very doctrinal and theologically rich book. And so I believe as we trek through Romans on these Wednesdays coming up, believe it's going to be deep. It's going to be a needed study for us to grasp doctrine. A lot of people these days in the 21st century they kind of run away from doctrine. But doctrine is what we need. We need to be equipped to understand the truths, the deep truths that make Christianity Christianity. Because just as we are watching sports games and you watch basketball games and if you're watching track and field as people are competing for the Olympics or the NBA championship they are competing according to the rules and so nobody plays basketball with football cleats a football helmet and a football nobody runs the 100 meter dash with combat boots on so when we come to understanding the key doctrinal truths of Christianity, we must understand that there are distinct doctrines which make Christianity Christianity. And so with that said, tonight we are going to be looking at the power of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. The power of the gospel. And I'll begin reading. Paul says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ. 
for all of you because your faith is being, your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may mutually that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For, I, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And if you want to know what the overarching theme of the book of Romans is, just look at verses 16 to 17 of Romans chapter 1. And that will give you the great grand theme of the book of Romans. The just shall live by faith, or the righteous shall live by faith faith. And so again, we're looking at the power of the gospel tonight and what I want us to glean from these verses that we read, I mean, we could spend a lot more time than we're going to spend tonight on these verses. There's just so much in each of these verses that time would not permit us to, you know, adequately cover how deep these verses go when it comes to to the deep Christian truths that it brings out. And so what I want us to look at tonight is the marks, some marks of the power of the gospel. Some marks of the power of the gospel have some characteristics, some character traits that the power of the gospel is working and effective and one of those first traits or marks that I believe that we can know that the power of the gospel is working or is effective is the gospel transforms our priorities. The gospel transforms our priorities. Because one of the first lessons I believe that many a new Christian learns is the importance of setting priorities. The importance of putting first things first. And so when we look at the very first verse that we just read, verse 8, the very first word that we see is, is that the Apostle Paul says the word first. See that? Yeah. So he's, he's already setting priorities. And so Paul was a man who had his priorities together. And I believe Jesus would want us to have our priorities together as well because he says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the other things will be added unto us. So he says, first I Thank my God. First, I thank my God. And we talked about what the, the significance of the word thank has on Sunday. Y'all remember that? On Sunday, we said the word thank, as it's translated here in verse 8, is translated as Eucharisto. And it's from where we get our word 
Eucharist, then whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we always give thanks. So Paul had set his priorities in that one of the first things he wanted to do is thank God. Paul had an attitude of gratitude. And so thanking God was something that Paul put first in his life. Thanking God was not something that came as an afterthought for the Apostle Paul. No, Paul thanked God first. But then if you notice, and I'm, tonight I'm using the ESV, but if, if you notice again in verse 8, he says, I thank my God. Which means Paul had a personal relationship with God. So if the first mark is setting the gospel transforms our priorities, the second mark is, is that the gospel aids us or the gospel helps us to understand the personal relationship that we have with God. Paul had a personal relationship with God. Hence he can say, I thank my God. And so Christianity, that we need to understand about Christianity is, is it's not about just rules. It's, it's not just about religious practices. Christianity is about being in a relationship. Yeah. A relationship with the one who redeemed us. And so just as Paul says, I thank my God, we too can say with a unified voice, we can say, I thank my God because it is through Jesus Christ, that we have access to God, that God becomes personal to us. So Paul says, I thank my God. And the reason he could say, I thank my God, is because he had been granted access to God through, as the text says, through Jesus Christ. And you all know Jesus' name. You know what that means, right? Jesus' name means the Lord saves. Christ. It, it, it basically is translated as kurios, Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. So our access to God, the Father, Jesus being God, comes through Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say in John 14 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so, come with me again to verse 8 because you'll notice the reason for Paul's thankfulness. He says, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So, the power of the gospel makes our faith practical. It makes our faith practical. Because when the faith, our faith, the faith, is not designed for us to hide it over in the corner so that nobody can see it. Our faith, the, the saving faith that we have is designed to be lived out practically in every area, sphere of our lives. So, the power of the gospel makes our faith practical for every area of our life. 
And so they had the kind of faith that was so practical that it was being bragged about throughout the Roman world. And we got to understand that there's a sense in which when Paul says uh, your faith, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world, that there's a sense in which there is a bit of uh, exaggeration on this part because uh, he's not thinking of world in the terms in, in the same way that we think of world. When we think of world, we're thinking about continents, we're thinking about the entire globe, the planets. When Paul is thinking, when he says world, when he uses world here, Paul is using world in the context of the Mediterranean world. So their faith was being heard about, talked about throughout the entire, throughout the entire Roman world. And so let me ask you tonight, do you have this kind of faith? Yeah. Do you have the kind of faith that can be bragged about, that can be talked about in your own world, in your own sphere of influence? Do you have the kind of faith that is worth boasting about? Because there's priorities, there's the person, the personal aspect of our faith, there's the practicality of our faith, but then we see that the gospel, the power of the gospel, when we start looking at verse 9, we see that the power of the gospel preoccupies us with wanting to serve. It preoccupies us with wanting to serve the Lord. Because again, in verse 9, if you look, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Do y'all see that? In the gospel of his Son. And so the word serve, Trail. It, it has two meanings. One meaning is to serve for a wage. The other meaning is to serve as a sacred or spiritual duty. Now, Paul was a Pharisee before he was converted. So Paul knew about serving for wages, serving for self-motivated interests. Even today, when we see some people who serve, some people serve only if they get a chance to shine. Hmm. They serve only if they can be the center of attention. But our motivation for serving the Lord shouldn't be for our own selfish interests. It shouldn't be for legalistic purposes as Paul did when he was a Pharisee. But our motivation for serving is because we are in fact saved. We've been redeemed. Because Paul's preoccupation with serving the Lord centered on the gospel of his son. The gospel of his son. The gospel. There's a lot of talk about the gospel, right? We hear people talk about gospel music. Gospel books, gospel, <laughs> gospel churches, <clears throat> gospel TV stations. We hear a lot of talk about gospel, but yet the, I don't think when people are mentioning the gospel, sometimes I don't believe that there's a lot of clarity regarding what folk mean 
when they say the gospel because it can mean different things to different people. It's become almost like the word gospel has become almost like Christianese, you know, where people just use it, just throw it around like they throw around the word love. You really don't know what they mean when they say love, but they just use the word and they use the word like gospel without understanding the biblical significance, the biblical understanding of what the word gospel means. The gospel, euangelion. It, it, come, it comes from the prefix eu. That's the prefix. And angelion is basically from where we get our word messenger, angel. And so you have the gospel message, which is the good news. The good news about who? The good news is about Jesus Christ, the gospel of his son. Yeah. Jesus Christ who came to die for our sins. So Paul had a gospel sin in life. And here's one of the dangers of being in church for a long time is that we can have the gospel in our head and not in our hearts. Mm. We can have the gospel in our heads, not in our hearts, and not have it to where it is utilized with our hands. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus, but Jesus is not in the heart. They just merely got head knowledge of Jesus. They don't have heart affection for Jesus, which leads them to utilize their hands to serve Jesus. Are y'all with me? So we've got to be living out the gospel with our heart, our hands, and utilizing our head. We don't check our brains in at the door when we come to church. We want to think. We want to think. We want to think about what's being said. We want to think about what's happening in the context of the church. So the gospel is Christ's gospel. But I want us to understand, too, that in verse 9, come back to verse 9, the second part after he says uh, the gospel of his son, where he says that without ceasing, I make mention of you, and then verse 10, always in my prayers. The power of the gospel makes us persistently passionate about prayer. Paul was passionate about prayer. Let's come back to verse 10. Always in my prayers asking somehow that God, that somehow by God's will, and that's very important, by God's will, I may now at least or at last succeed in coming to you. And as we all know, if you read the book of Acts, Paul, he did not found the church at Rome. Paul had not visited this church at Rome. We know that as we're preaching on Sunday mornings, we're working our way through Ephesians that Paul eventually made it to Rome because he was being persecuted by Jewish religious leaders. And so Paul utilized his Roman citizenship and he appealed to Caesar. So Paul eventually made it to Rome, but he made it to Rome in chains. Mm. Well. So as we read it, through working our way through Ephesus, we understand that Eph the, the working our way through Ephesians, rather, we understand Paul was at Rome writing to the, the Christians at Ephesus, and, and, and Ephesians is one of the prison epistles where Paul was writing to the, the saints at Ephesus from Rome in prison. So Paul had never met these Roman saints before. But he wanted to see them. We know he wanted to see them because he'd been praying for them. If you really want to 
intercede for you, you pray for him. He was praying for him and he was wanting by the will of God to be able to see them. He understood that his success was not going to come based upon his own efforts, but ultimately his success was going to come from God. And, and apparently at this particular time in Paul's life, God's will was not for him to be in Rome. And sometimes we need to understand that when it comes to the will of God, sometimes God will open up a door. Sometimes God may shut a door. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God may say go. Sometimes God's going to say no. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God is going to say slow. Yeah. And so God hadn't answered Paul's prayer yet. And there's many of us in here tonight that God hasn't answered our prayers yet, right? Mm -hmm. But just because God has not answered our prayers don't mean that we stop praying. We continue to pray until God gives us an answer. Look with me at what he says and look with me, look with me at what uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, he says, verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, as verse 8, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. So the, the, the emphasis is to continue knocking, continue seeking, persistently ask until God reveals his will for you. Amen. So, Gospel makes us passionate about prayer. Not only this, the gospel makes us people persons. <laughs> the gospel makes us people persons. You know, we are not saved to be long ranger Christians. Mm -hmm. Even the long ranger had time to. He has not saved us for us to live in isolation apart from other Christians. He wants us to be amongst other Christians so we can draw support from one another. That's how you grow strong in the faith, by hanging around other Christians. Listen, you don't grow strong in the faith hanging at the nightclub. You can't grow strong in the faith and hang around a group of unbelievers all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to say that if, you, if, if your circle is or consists of a bunch of unbelievers, I'm willing to say and prognosticate that those people are going to lead you away from Christ rather than draw you closer to Christ because their minds are going to be set on two different things. You all are going to be unequally yoked. And so they're going to be pulling in this direction. You're going to be like, oh, I think I want to go in this direction. But then eventually they may be able to pull you away to the point to where you don't even want to hang around Christians anymore. So we've got to be people persons, but we can't allow people to lead us away from Christ. Paul was a people person. The gospel should make us want to be around the church, around other Christians, because look at verses 11 to 13. He says, for I long to see you. I'm longing to see you. Do you long to be with the saints? <laughs> I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. You see the, re the reciprocity there? It's going back and forth. I'm encouraging you and you're encouraging me. That we may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. 
I want you to know, brothers, verse 13, that I have often intended to come to you. There it is again. But thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. I've been prevented. He wanted to come, but he couldn't. A similar situation happened in Acts to the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Let's start at verse 6. He says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And the vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. As a result of Paul going into Macedonia, don't you know the gospel was spread into all of Europe? Amen. See, sometimes we want to be able to go to Bithynia. But God has you in Troas. He has you in a hard place. And the reason God has you in a hard place is because he's got something better that he Amen. wants to do with your life. He has a better option by which he's going to utilize your life for his namesake and the spread of the gospel. So Paul wanted to share his spiritual gift. He wanted to impart a spiritual gift. And that's what that impartation means, sharing. It's not like some of these word of faith teachers be saying on television that I'm going to impart, I got the power to impart a spiritual gift to give you a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts don't come from people. Amen. Spiritual gifts come from God. So don't never let anybody tell you that they have the power to give you or impart a spiritual gift, gift to you. It's the sharing of the mutual gifts, the charisma that, that God has given to each of us. And, and there is a reciprocity that moves back and forth. That's the reason why every Christian has a spiritual gift. God has given each Christian a gift to be used in his service in order for the mutual edification, the building up of the body of Christ. Amen. Never think for one minute that you are here and insignificant. If you are here, God has a gift for you to use. He has given you a gift to use in this local assembly to help this local body. Yeah. Everybody has a gift. And we use our gifts to help encourage one another. We use our gifts of grace to help encourage one another. So never think of that. Just because God didn't let you go to the place where you wanted to go, that he still doesn't have a way to use you for his service. You may not, you may have thought that was the best option. But God is saying, no, I got a better option. I got a better way that you can be used in my service. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is what do we do when God does not allow you to go into Bithynia, but he leaves you in Troas. Do you submit 
to God's will? Do you go pushing on ahead? Because God, out of his grace, again, opens up all kinds of doors in our lives, and he closes even doors in our lives in order for us to focus upon what he wants us to do. And so, Paul's mission was about reaping harvest. Let's come back to uh, verse 13. He says, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Verse 14, I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. You see that? His mission was reaping harvest. Harvest refers to fruit. Paul was centered on reaping spiritual fruit. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, right? He says, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And so Jesus wants us to bear spiritual fruit. What is the fruit of the spirit? Let's go to Galatians. Let's read it. Galatians chapter 5, 22, verse, starting in verse 22, it says, uh, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. He wants us to be showing the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of our lives. And listen, not only the fruit of our lives, but the fruit of our lips as well. Yeah. The fruit of our lives and the fruit of our lips. Look at what uh, the writer of uh, Hebrews says in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. See to it. The see to it in, in Hebrews are very rich. See to it. <laughs> that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, that many become defiled. But I was reading actually verse 12, I mean chapter 12. I'm, I'm a chapter uh, behind, so I'm going to have to turn to the right one. <laughs> I was in chapter 12, but that's good too. <laughs> 13 and 5, keep your life free from the love of money. Be can, uh, 13 and 15 is what I mean. That, that works too. 13 right. and 5, <laughs> keep your, I mean the fruit of right. our life. Keeping our lives free from the love of money. Being content with what we have. For he said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. You know, the seeing to it that no, no one fails to obtain the grace of God, no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That works too. As far as the fruit of our lives, those are things that we want to keep yeah. from taking over our lives. But in verse 15 of Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips or the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name or blesses his name. Amen. And so every Christian should not only have fruit of that comes from our lives, but fruit that comes from our lips. And so Paul was ultimately saying that our life and our lips need to match. And so 
Paul's lips and his life match because he said he was obligated to serve. Do you see that right there? Not just some people. He was under obligation to both Greeks and barbarians, to the wise and the foolish. He was under obligation to those who were sophisticated and those who were not so sophisticated. He was obligated to serve all kinds of people. See, we got to serve all kinds of people. We can't be partial. Because at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We are all sinners at the foot of the cross, begging for bread. As a matter of fact, we're all sinners at the foot of the cross trying to tell another beggar how to find bread. So, the gospel, the power of the gospel, ultimately, is what we preach. The power of the gospel is ultimately what we preach. Because look at verse 15. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. Also, who are I want to preach the gospel to you. That's what he's saying. You know, with all the technological advances that we have, there's very little gospel being preached today. Yeah. People have, have drifted into this felt needs preaching. But we need to stick to the good news of the gospel. The gospel, again, is about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Not only what he did for us on the cross, but what he did for us through his life by living his life perfectly for us and giving his life as a perfect sacrifice. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus lived a perfect life for our righteousness because it's his righteous life that is imputed to our lives. Jesus rose from the grave in the same body that he was crucified in. Jesus ascended into heaven. But Jesus is going to return again. So the gospel is all about Jesus. And Jesus is the gospel. The gospel is not about what we have done. The gospel is all about what God in Christ has done. Amen. And you know the gospel message is unpopular today. It sure is. And the reason why I believe the gospel message is unpopular today is because it's an unattractive message. Who wants to be told that they got a problem? And their problem is not with you. Their problem is with God. They got a problem that they can't fix themselves. The problem that they have can only be fixed by God. So the gospel is an unattractive message. The gospel message exposes our weaknesses. The gospel exposes our ungodliness. And the gospel will and shall always be a stumbling block to all human beings because they stumble over the provision that God has made through Christ. In order for mankind to be saved, there's not two ways, there's not three ways, there's not four ways, there's one way. Amen. But finally, the power of the gospel, or shall I say it this way, as the title says, uh, the gospel is the power of God. 
gospel is the power of God. In verse 16. And verse 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. Dunamis. It's a disruptive force for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first also to the Greek. When Jesus commissioned his apostles, what did he do? He sent them to the Jew first. Because the, the message has always been to the Jew first. God's people. He made them a people through Abraham. He made them a people through Abraham. They rebelled against God and they ended up in bondage in Egypt. But the message of God's saving grace, because there's grace, saving grace in both the Old and New Testament. God chose them not because they were a special people. He made them a people. He chose them out of his own sovereign mercy and grace. And so gospel to the Jew first, then to the Greek. The gospel is first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. We are grafted in. I don't want to get into Romans 9, but Paul says, I am. And this is like the third, this, this is like, he uses this I am in me. He uses it in uh, verse 14, I am. Verse 15, I am. Verse 16, I am. This is the third I am statement in Romans chapter 1. And y'all know what oh, I am is, right? Jesus says, I am, which pointed to his deity. When Paul uses I am, he's referring to his purpose and his mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our mission, our purpose is to serve the great I am. Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel because of the gospel's power. So the gospel has power to save. Save those who believe. The gospel produces salvation. The gospel brings us to saving faith. Because to receive Jesus as Savior is more than just mental assent. To believe is more than just simply agreeing with the facts about who Jesus is. The devil believes the facts about who Jesus is. But the devil will not submit to the Lordship of Jesus. So to believe is more than just giving mental assent. To believe is to trust Jesus. And what I, the, the illustration I like to use when we say trust is the fact that when most of you all probably came in here tonight, nobody checked up under the pew to make sure that the pew was going to hold them. So we were trusting in the pew. We put our faith in the pew to hold us up. In the same way, we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus to hold us up. We got to rely on Jesus and Jesus alone to save us. Because everything we do in life operates by faith. I mean, we get in the car and drive our cars 60 and 70, 80, sometimes some people 90 miles up and down the highway by faith in our car. We go to the water tap, turn on the water, drink water from the tap, drink water from a bottle. You don't know where that bottle came from. You don't know, you really don't know where that water came from, but you drink it by faith. 
We eat all kind of food. How many folk leave and go to Mickey D's? You eat a Big Mac. Do you really know what's in a Big Mac? Do you really know what's in a Big Mac? Do you really know what's in a Whopper? Do you really know what's in that cheeseburger that you eat? So we eat that stuff by faith without even knowing all the ingredients. Do you know what the special sauce is? I know we say Thousand Island, but do you know everything that's in there? <laughs> so what, we talk, what I'm talking about here is natural faith. What I just talked about, drinking water, eating a Big Mac, eating a water. We, we driving a car 80 miles an hour up and down the expressway. That's natural faith. What Paul is talking about is supernatural faith. The kind of faith that you know that you are incapable of producing in and of yourselves. It's the kind of faith that God has to produce in us. It's a gift. It's what, let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. This is a classic verse right here. Verse 8. For it is by grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. This is not of your own doing. You can't produce supernatural faith. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. So, salvation doesn't come from us. Salvation doesn't come from living a good moral life. Salvation don't come through being baptized. Salvation don't come by being a member of a local church. Salvation only comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, God is not a respecter of persons when it comes to whom he will save. And so, it's in the gospel, the power of the gospel, that the righteousness of God is revealed. That's what he says in verse 17. From faith for faith. From faith for faith. He's talking about how the gospel is particularly applied to our lives. It's a particular application to our lives that is supernatural. And the righteousness which comes from God, this righteousness, DK Asune, that's the word there. This righteousness, it's a foreign righteousness. It's not a righteousness that you can produce in and of yourself because all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before the sight and presence of a holy God. So God's righteousness is not done by us. But his righteousness is done for us as a result of us being justified by faith. The doctrine, again, I said it earlier, the doctrine of justification by faith is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. When we lose the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone you no longer have Christianity Amen. you've got something else when you lose the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone you no longer have Christianity you got something else. And there are a lot of churches on corners. And there are a lot of preachers in pulpits 
who believe in something else other than the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. There are a lot of people who like to sprinkle a little works in there. They'll say, you know, well, Jesus did 99% of the work. All I got to do is the 1%. No, Jesus paid it all. He didn't just pay for some of it. He paid it all. And all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. So we have a foreign righteousness. We've been declared righteousness. Justificare is the Latin word that the Latins would use. Justificare, where they, they understood that this was something that came out of the law courts. And so when we stand before God by faith in Christ, God no longer sees us in our own righteousness. He sees us in the righteousness of Christ and he makes a legal declaration, not guilty. Amen. Amen. He makes us, he declares us rather righteous. He declares us righteous in Christ. This is what Paul was saying in 2 Corinthians 5.21. When he said God made him to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Our righteousness from God begins with faith, ends with faith. In other words, it's going to be faith when you get saved, faith when you get justified. Faith as God is sanctifying us. It will be faith when God glorifies us in his presence and the presence of the Son. So, we'll live by faith until the Lord comes again. Hence, he says, the righteous shall live by faith. Some translations have the just. The just shall live by faith. He's quoting from an Old Testament minor prophet, Habakkuk. 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 Or Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2 and 4. The just shall live by faith. Those who have been truly declared righteous by a holy and righteous God are going to live their lives by faith in the one who saved them. That's faith when you feel like you're on the mountaintop. Yeah. Live by faith when you feel like you're going through the valley. Yeah. Live by faith when you feel like your life is in the south part of hell. Gehenna. <laughs> the just shall live by faith. Because we've been justified by faith. And this comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, God bless you all tonight. Amen.